All right, well, good af afternoon, everybody. I think we'll begin. Uh, it's really lovely to welcome you here at Lotherton Hall. It's great to see so many of you, so thanks for coming in this terrible weather. Um, it's my great pleasure today to um, introduce to you Professor Graham Gooday and his work on domesticating electricity, and also to introduce to you some of the project work that we've been doing. My name's Claire Jones, and I'm the director of the Museum of the History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the University of Leeds. And today's uh, talk and uh, project launch really uh, springs off a, uh, from a project called Ignite, called Domesticating Electricity, which uh, at the university we've been involved with at Lotherton Hall. The first stage of the project we developed um, in conjunction with um, a primary school, and we did a project uh, based on Dr. Uh, Professor Gooday's book on domesticating electricity to look at how electricity first came into the home in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and all the things that went along with that. So concerns about safety, uh, issues around gender, uh, and decoration in the home, interior design, these kinds of uh, things. And we worked with a primary school group to look at how electricity in the home has changed and how they could not possibly conceive of a, of a world without the Xbox and things like that. So that was really interesting in the first stage of the project. This second stage of the project, um, ha we've had an intern who's here today and has worked very hard, uh, Kiara, um, to help with the reinterpretation of the servants' gallery here at Lotherton Hall. So we're looking at how electricity affected the lives of servants that worked here um, at Lotherton Hall. And we'll, we'll hear from Professor Gooday about his work in the first hour about domesticating electricity <coughs> and in the second hour we'll all be free to um, go into the servants gallery have a look at the exhibition some of the electrical items there and have tea and cake so um, the first hour the uh, Professor Gooday will speak for around 40 to 45 minutes uh, about domesticating electricity, uh, a really interesting talk. Then we'll have time for some questions, so 15 minutes of questions. Uh, and then in the second hour we'll go uh, into the servants' gallery and you're free to walk around the home. On your chair you'll notice that there's a, a trail for you to kind of pinpoint some of the electrical items around the home as you go around. Uh, and also on your seats, there's an evaluation form, and we really, really would appreciate your feedback on today's events and some of the things that you've heard and seen. So if you'd like to fill them out, we'd be really grateful. There's some pens at the back, so do fill, out, fill them out and give them to one of us, uh, and we'd be really grateful for that. Um, so I'll stop talking now. So without further ado, I'll, in, I'll introduce to, to you Professor Graham Gooday. He is a professor of the history of technology um, and um, his work, including domesticating electricity, um, is very well known and well respected in the field. Um, his most recent work has been on electricity in, the, in um, patenting, um, but also uh, he's done a lot of work on technology and measurement. Um, and if you'd just like to join me in welcoming him, um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Claire, and also to Chiara for helping set this uh, day up. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm uh, suffering from a slightly sore throat, but I have some visuals to help me get through the occasion. Well, indeed, anyway, the topic today is uh, domesticating electricity, and what I want to do is take you back to a time when uh, this strange um, being, entity, agency, whatever you want, a kind of magic something, first came into the home, and it was not a very straightforward process. I mean, think, for example, why one might have needed to have books called The Electric Light in Our Homes, uh, popularly explained and illustrated. Who would need a book like that now to explain why you need electric light? I shall give you an idea about why such books were required. Similarly, why would one see advertising of this sort for artistic fittings for electric lighting? Why would you do that? Um, particularly, indeed, seeing a female image. Uh, I shall uh, talk about a little bit um, uh, the nature of um, electricity being epitomised in human form, mostly but not always female form, holding up the light of truth and justice, you know, showing that electric futures were the way into uh, the modern safe world against the wickedness of gas and candles. Okay. So that's um, the title. Uh, the key themes, well, obviously, firstly, how did it come into everyday life? I think many uh, who have written about the history of electric uh, lighting and power in the home, I think historians haven't really thought about there being any problem. Normally one says, why, why was it so late in arriving, given that Faraday was working on this back in the 1820s? Well, I'll explain why that's the case. Um, 
what kind of problems were there? Well, there are many kinds of problems, problems um, which I shall talk about uh, shortly, which may seem a little strange now, but I hope you will see from uh, some items of, of literature that these problems are not so alien from the worlds of art and novels. Um, how are those problems overcome? Well, just I think one word, I suppose, is glamorization. I mean, who would have thought that electric lighting was glamorous? Well, perhaps Lotherton Hall is a particularly good place to illustrate that point. You, you can see here some of the original fittings, and I think not all are, but many are, aren't they, Chiara? Um, still here from 1903 in uh, perhaps slightly amended forms. And you can see what a spectacular effect they have. And indeed, uh, nobody gets burnt alive by, by touching them, and no uh, soot marks appear in the ceiling. No furniture gets stained by the acid produced. That is the, the joy of electric lighting, everyone. Um, but that was the solution. Um, I want to bring in also a sense in which the solutions were not uh, seen equally upstairs and downstairs. Uh, it is not, as you can imagine, very easy to recapture the views of household servants or whatever one might think from Downtown Abbey. But I found some interesting stories indicating that servants took a somewhat different view of electric lighting to the masters and mistresses of the houses in which it was being installed. Okay. Um, and then at the, the very end, I'll just briefly touch on some of the researches that um, Chiara has uh, done very helpfully, actually, indicating how this all applies to the case of Otherton Hall, and gesture towards a sort of bigger picture. I mean, no one has yet really looked at all the country houses in Yorkshire, let alone the UK, but we have a sense that this house was, I think, fairly early on in a cycle of electrification in the early 20th century. So then, um, I'll give you a little background on me. Um, I was what they call a a teenage science student. I spent much of my years um, at university and at school actually uh, giving nasty electric shocks to myself and my teachers. I think they were all probably very pleased when I took up history of science instead. Everyone was much safer now. But my, my mother did point out to me the wisdom of this because she remembered that she was raised by um, her great um, aunt Emily, my great great aunt, of course, who uh, never touched anything electrical till the day she died in the 1950s, advising my mother to do likewise, and me too, actually, but in indirectly. <laughs> and um, what was fascinating is my mother remembered two kinds of cases. Um, I, I won't talk about them both, but one is the novel Monica Dickens. Uh, have any of you read Flowers on the Grass? I have a copy here. In the very first chapter, um, th the main character, Jane, um, finds herself having a perfectly ordinary start of the day in, in the kitchen. But she, uh, she actually touches an electric kettle, she has electric shock, and dies. Okay, and that struck a deep chord in, I think, many people who read that. And that, that wasn't such an unfamiliar fear at the time, okay, that you would actually just touch something electrical and you'd be dead. And the, her, her last thoughts were, who's going to feed my baby when, I, when I'm gone? So it's a very touching tale. Uh, but also, more recently, you may have come across the book by Victoria Clendinning called Electricity. There's a story told there of a workman who dies in the process of installing uh, an electric um, generator in a country house. That's a reworking of a story which I'll tell you about shortly. Um, and then, lastly, well, this inspired me to write a book which was published in 2008. Um, and I'm not going to be so vulgar as to promote it. It's uh, very hard to get hold of now, apparently, anyway. Uh, but if you pay uh, careful attention, you won't need to buy the book anyway. Okay. <laughs> so there we have it. Okay. Um, so then, I think looking at the problems, um, what I want to give you a sense of is that the word domesticating deliberately has two meanings. One is bringing it into the home, you know, the idea that um, electricity belonged initially outdoors, for example, in arc lighting and, in, uh, say, for example, electroplating workshops to uh, plate silver. But it also means something more, I guess, metaphorical, that is of taming um, electricity. Taming as one might tame a wild animal, uh, so it learns to behave well in the household world. Um, and it's not clear that we fully tamed it, but mostly we have now, but it was a definitely uh, a big challenge back in the late 19th century to do so. Um, there are various problems which I can uh, I just summarise for you briefly. Firstly, there was an enormous concern about the nature of electricity. Okay. Everybody sort of knew what coal was. Gas was a bit more, um, um, I suppose, ethereal, but at least you knew when it, gas was leaking and the chemist could tell you what it was made of and how it might be toxic. But the great difficulty it was, even physicists couldn't agree what it was. Was it the kind of energy? Was it kind of fluid? Was it some quirk in the ether? Was it some transcendent agency from God? They couldn't agree among themselves. So it was difficult for customers in the home to think that they were secure in what they were buying, what they were paying for. How can you quantify that which you can't actually touch, measure, or weigh? And um, worse than that, being invisible and intangible, the risks were very hard to apprehend for those who are not highly skilled in understanding electrical power. Um, the shocks of, uh, well, the, the idea of getting electric shock 
was actually quite uh, unnerving. I mean, if you touched a gas pipe, you weren't liable to actually uh, have any uh, harm befall you. But with electric cable, it could be very quick death or just a mild shock. It was very hard for those who weren't expert to know what to expect. And even then, if things were not well wired, the risks were greater than even the experts might have thought. Injuries and death therefore resulted, uh, not as many as the gas industry, which was very worried about this, liked to emphasise, but there were still certain numbers of deaths. It was also often uh, quite unreliable. Um, before the days of the national grid, which actually only really arrived um, in the 1940s fully, and some pointed out to me recently that actually one village in Wales only got hooked up, I think, in the last five years, so it's taken quite a while. Um, until then, uh, many power supplies were just local dynamos in the garden or in the house, such was the case here. And you can imagine that um, if that dynamo stopped working for any reason or the fuel ran out, there was no more electric light. And even then, if things were working well, there could be some unpleasant incidents with lights breaking down or sparks flying around. It was also um, unavoidably um, expensive. I mean, um, if you have your own dynamo and your own generator in the garden, that's going to be a bit more expensive than having candles or oil lamps. Okay, so originally it was only the wealthiest in society that could afford to have electric lighting, such as, for example, the owners, um, the gas coins of, of um, Lotherton Hall. And the last point to bring out, which may not be very obvious, we perhaps might be aware of this issue in the transition recently from old-fashioned incandescent lamps to the eco lights we now have to buy. Are you aware of a slight shift in quality of lighting? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting recapitulation of a debate which happened back in the late 19th century, that many uh, people, actually it was mostly women, um, actually turns out to have believed that electric lighting was garish, unpleasant, okay, very ugly. I mean, how many, for example, of you by uh, comparison have seen gas lighting? Um, there is a wonderful pub in Beverly called the, I think the, uh, the, the Nag or the White Horse, which has it. It's beautifully subtle. It doesn't show up the dirt. It doesn't show up the, the lines on your face and your age. It allows all sorts of discreet things to happen, actually, in the, in the dark corners, actually. Yeah. And uh, electric light uh, spares you nothing. Uh, there's much to be said about the possibility that the large-scale concern with household hygiene and the wearing of makeup come with the gearing clinical gaze of the electric light in the early 20th century. So, but that's another story which I have yet to find someone to research for me. Um, so what I want to do, though, um, is to say that rather than giving you just a sort of technocratic view on this, I want to <coughs> emphasise the role of women, because um, it's vital to note that any decision about what to bring in the home often relied upon the judgment of at least one woman. Uh, the, the household um, and, um, had to be managed by somebody. And in the case of the Churchills and Mrs. Alice Gordon, they were the ones who took decisions about how and when um, electric lighting and other things might be introduced. Okay. And you might hear some uh, slightly unexpected turns in the uh, Churchill family history that uh, I think uh, Winston might have outshadowed in, in later years. So then, um, to give you a little notion about how there's an issue of gender in all of this, how particularly that um, uh, women found themselves really uncomfortable with this new electric light. This is from Punch in 1889, and one of my, my joys a few years ago was to work on a project where looking at Punch magazines all day was an age task. Uh, occasionally coming up with some interesting evidence of things that one might otherwise have forgotten that, uh, that were worth satirising. One of which is the extremely bright electric light, and it was... The subject of some discussion, particularly by a character called Mrs. Gordon, I will talk about more shortly, and that um, electric light was often installed without shades on it. Very, very bright and glaring. Women were often obliged, if they couldn't get a lampshade onto the lamp, they have to cover themselves up with parasols. And the rather arch comment here, I think clearly from a male observer, is happy thought. The electric light uh, is so favourable to furniture, wallpapers, pictures, screens, by not damaging it, unlike gaslight. Uh, it's not always becoming to the female complexion. Light Japanese sunshades will be found invaluable, you see there. Okay. <laughs> so that's part of the story, which I'll come back to. Now, um, what I want to emphasise now is that um, the first kind of lighting that arrived in um, the world from um, electrical sources, uh, particularly in London, was not the incandescent light with which we associate the names of um, Edison, if one is American, uh, or Swan, if one is actually British, particularly if one is from Newcastle. Um, I'll explain that uh, later in the questions, if you like. But uh, the arc light was very dazzling. Um, some of you may have come across arc lights, for example, outdoors at fairgrounds and football stadia. Uh, they're very effective at making you feel that it's almost daylight, but they're not pleasant to look at, are they, actually? You don't want to spend too much time under them. But um, these are the first sorts introduced well before Edison got his act together. Um, Edison announced the invention of the electric light in 1878 and didn't get round to making it available because it was so unreliable until three years later. So in the meantime, the arc light took the centre stage, particularly in lighting London streets. So you can see in um, 1881, just before 
Edison's um, and Swan's lights arrive. Um, there are various uh, demonstrations. The brush light on the Thames Embankment there, um, lighting also on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral. Um, Mansion uh, Hall, was that Mansion House, um, Guild Hall on the London Bridge. This is all from the graphic uh, from uh, April 1881. And you can see from there, it is quite spectacular. Okay, search lights everywhere. Now, you wouldn't think they would actually use that indoors, would you? What, what, what sane person would bring that into the you know, dining room? Well, um, I will give you thoughts on that in a second, but let me just show you now that such was the loathing uh, by some of arc lighting that um, poetry, some might call it doggerel, I couldn't possibly comment, it was written in response. Now, the uh, great Western Railway terminus at Paddington was one of the er earliest places to have a very large installation in public. This was, um, this was from 1885. In my 1888, people had got quite fed up nearby. So you had this little verse. Twinkle, twinkle, little arc, sickly blue, uncertain spark. Up above my head you swing, ugly, strange, expensive thing. Cold, unlovely, blinding star. I've no notion what you are, how your wondrous system works, who controls its jumps and jerks. Now the flaring gas is gone from the realms of Paddington. You must show your quivering light, twinkle, blinkle, left and right. Though your light perchance surpass homely oil or vulgar gas, I guess the rhyme must go, still I close with this remark, I detest you, little ark. Okay, so no love lost there. Okay, who would have it in a home? Well, um, let me just give you oops, an idea that the natural lighting for the home would have been the incandescent light. And the issue of aesthetics comes up very much in Edison's promotion. Okay. Uh, Edison um, was busy promoting in 1880, uh, one whole year before the electric light became available, the idea that uh, the electric incandescent light was certainly at least more aesthetically pleasant to view than gas light. Okay. It requires no shades, no screen. Um, e even arguing, actually, in ways that I think are a little hard to believe, that it was uh, a purer light than gas, although some would say that uh, gas light is, is more yellow. What you also see, at the same time, to promote appreciation of electric light, is I think images definitely targeted towards men. Uh, the figure I showed you at the start of uh, Faraday and Sons, a goddess, uh, was like the Statue of Liberty, pointing truth and light. There were, there were versions of, the, of this which were less for family viewing, shall we say. This is the, the, the German version, the German Edison Company, with, a, uh, I think, a Valkyrie uh, riding a unicycle with the wings on, actually pointing a very aggressively electric light at you into the future, saying, this is for you, bring it into your home now. Okay, this is the, the Edison German style. Okay, but it still wasn't available. So what do you find, then, is that... Um, one of our most famous Conservative Prime Ministers, Lord Salisbury. Uh, have some of you are known of him. He's not often discussed as much as his counterpart, William Gladstone. But he actually did try to put electric arc lighting into his home in Hatfield House. At least he saw his house, I think, much to the consternation of his relatives, particularly his uh, female kin, saw his whole house at Hatfield as being a large laboratory for him to try out new things in. Okay. And um, he did actually put an arc light above the dining room table. Okay, and his daughter, uh, uh, um, Gwendolyn, in her reminiscences of her father, says, uh, for a brief period, his family and guests were obliged to uh, eat their dinners underneath the vibrating glare, and arc lights do vibrate. Um, um, and he found that no um, exertion of goodwill or courtesy could actually stop the complaints of the ladies who just load this experience of arc lighting over their dinner. Okay, and eventually he gave up, you know, unable to deal with what he called a, um, the way the feminine vanity defied the conquest of science. That's her version of it anyway, actually. I'm sure he had a rather more vigorous version. Um, but that wasn't the only problem that Lord Salisbury had. I mean, I should say this is one of the, the, the many examples of electric lighting being installed only at first in um, country houses where there was sufficient wealth and scope for experimentation. But other things went wrong. Um, one of the big features of the book is the death that took place um, in late 1881 of a labourer in the gardens of the Hatfield House. He just happened, it seems, and no one saw exactly what happened. He happened to touch um, a bear, uh, that is, uninsulated raw cable, carrying electric power from an alternate current generator by the lake, which is, of course, being fed by hydroelectric power. And this was reported quite widely. Um, I mean, it's worth emphasising that in the Victorian period, the death of workmen and workwomen was actually not worth uh, reporting normally in the Times newspaper. I mean, dozens would die every day without anyone in the upper classes troubling too much about it. But this one attracted a lot of interest, I mean, this death. And it, um, it, and it was reported in the Times, and this, this particular copy was actually shared around many other newspapers and journals. Um, and you can see why. I mean, clearly, uh, 
Salisbury at that point was not in, not in office as Prime Minister, but certainly he was very much a manager politician. And um, many eminent visitors came to his home. Uh, not least, of course, the gas industry were delighted that one accident could take place which would so much, uh, would so effectively illustrate the perils of having electric power and near to people who didn't really understand its perils. Okay. Um, and this incident is widely discussed, widely discussed in many, many ways. Um, and what you see is, for example, uh, very quickly, uh, the swan lamp is brought in. Okay, I should emphasise that, um, that at Hatfield House you had arc lighting using alternate current power. What you find very quickly is that uh, direct current is introduced, because much of the blame for the Hatfield accident is placed on the dangers, the very high voltages that are used in alternate currents. Uh, direct current is safer okay, in ways that perhaps we might have lost a thought of. Um, uh, particularly, it works well with a new swan incandescent lamp. And this is, of course, um, Rothbury. So are any of you are familiar with Rothbury? Maybe even work there. Yeah. Um, this is a crag side. Crag side, you see that it's got um, swan lights all around. Uh, they're covered in tasteful globes to actually make them a little less, less dazzling. And the point here, of course, is that Armstrong had been one of Swan's benefactors in um, supporting the production of, of Swan's electric lights. Um, and of course, Armstrong then uh, returns the gesture in many other ways by um, helping Swan to promote the light in his house. And this is again from the graphic, illustrating, as it were, um, very graphically, how elegant this new lighting can be, unlike the arc light, trying to draw attention away from the, the disasters uh, that took place at Hatfield House. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, it's clear that there is much concern uh, still from the episode of Hatfield House's uh, dead labourer. Um, and Robert Hammond, in his book, The Electric Light in a Home, with which I, I opened this talk, um, reports many stories of servants who are just terrified. Um, they've actually got a really strong sense that this electric light is not for them. It's going to make their life really unpleasant. And he, he reports one of, his, one of his own servants who actually comes to him and, uh, after arriving in the house, learns a few days in that there is electric light, uh, and she says she begged to be allowed to leave to actually uh, enter her, her contract very quickly, fearing that she some night be uh, blown into the street, okay, bed and all. Uh, but interestingly, um, he reports that it is his other servants, his, uh, the fellow servants, who try to advise her this is actually nothing to worry about. You know, he, he says that uh, my servants are great authorities on the electric light question. Okay, a rather interesting claim. There's no possible danger to her if everything is handled by an expert such as Hammond. Uh, she had nothing to dread. But actually, she left anyway. Okay, she just didn't believe what she was told. She'd heard so, so many worrying rumours. Okay. And Hammond blames in his book, actually, this sort of fear on the machinations of the gas company, spreading rumours of this sort. Though, to no avail for Hammond, because Hammond himself having spent a lot of time and trouble touring Britain promoting electric lighting, indeed his own kind of light, using this book, actually himself went bankrupt. He, he was unable to persuade enough householders to install electric lighting in 1884, this year. You see how perilous and precarious the whole process of electric lighting was financially and also technologically. Um, but I should emphasise that in all of this, what he does do, I mean, one thing that does start to work, and, and this is one of Hammond's legacies to the debate, um, and he's talking about Lord Salisbury's accident, and he shows you how if you have the right kind of direct current battery, you can hold the handles, uh, you hold the terminals, and uh, nothing will happen to you. What he does is to say, well, actually, whatever you might think about the dangers of electric light, have you really thought about how bad gas lighting is? So, what he does to promote the safety of electric light is explain to you how much more dangerous gas light has been if you hadn't already realised. Um, and he emphasises that, for example, the, the perfect light for the home, and he portrays electric lighting as being the perfect light, uh, shouldn't rob our rooms of, of oxygen. Okay? That's the wicked thieving thing that gas lights do, he wants to tell you. Uh, shouldn't add noxious fumes to the air. And of course, if you know gas lighting, until the arrival of the gas mantle in the 1890s, Certainly, old gas lighting did leave sulfuric acid and worse, particularly damaging paintings and leather book bindings. Okay. Nor be a source of danger in the house. Again, moot point, one might say. Nor be an unpleasant light. Okay. And there we come back again to the issue of aesthetics, that for many people who might have been persuaded of the relative safety of electric light, still its ugliness or its uh, garishness was a big problem. Okay. So, where should we go next with this one? Um, well, it is, once again, Back to punch, um, I go. Um, the, the kind of challenge that Hammond encountered was it was not only arc lighting that many people, particularly women, found objectionable, but actually incandescent lighting as well. And here's, here's a little piece from Punch. I hope you don't mind the, the odd bit of doggerel to lighten up the, the talk. Um, another one. Um, this is from 
a horticultural exhibition in 1882, and I should emphasise that to promote electric lighting, it was often used both in theatres, such as the Savoy Theatre in London, um, but in any public exhibition where electric lighting could be used and perhaps thought to be safer than gas lighting. And this one uh, evinced in Punch uh, magazine in July 1882 from a horticultural exhibit. Oh, cruel electricity that gives so strong a light in many an unprotected lamp, you f your flash, uh, so you flash supremely bright. And vainly art aids nature now in an, an unobtrusive way. This lamp malign of Edison's is worse than brightest day. A veil many serve to screen from sun, but when in evening dress, there's nothing twixt these awful lamps and female loveliness. And definitely a male writer, I think. Then, men of science, you must aid and tell us, if you please, how we shall make our charms withstand such glaring lights as these. For if the ladies find his lamps still turn them pale and wan, they'll lead a feminine crusade against Edison and Swan. Okay. So there you have it. Aesthetics is the major blocking point, actually, in the adoption of early electric light, particularly for uh, both sorts. Now, what then happens is rather interesting that um, to overcome this concern about aesthetics, some of the most uh, eminent um, and glamorous uh, figures in politics uh, are sought out uh, for their assistance. Um, Rooks, even in Bell Crompton, who manufactured some of the earliest dynamos and lighting systems, himself a veteran of um, India in the 1870s, um, made a point, actually, of contacting through his army uh, network uh, the Churchills, who had a, a house in Maryland in London. And Lady, Chir uh, Lady Churchill, this is, um, this is down here, actually, Jenny Jerome. You see the family resemblance to Winston, I think, very clearly? You know, maybe not. She was American, uh, an heiress, an extremely smart and astute lady. Um, basically, uh, was the one who managed the process of getting a freebie. Okay, the, the Crompton Company gave the Churchills a free electric light installation in order that they would actually use it at the dinner parties to entertain many of the aristocracy and political elites of the day. Um, and certainly, she reports in a, in a later autobiography, she was known then as Mrs. Cornwallis West after a second marriage, after her first husband, uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, died. And she reports that this was actually rather an exciting event. I mean, there are many houses which are supposed to be the first in London to have electric lighting, but I think this might be the, the one. Um, they had a small dynamo down below, of course, which is where the uh, power came from, which was so exciting uh, that actually passing horses would often rear up actually and not want to pass the house. So people noticed so much so that uh, you know uh, locals um, asked uh, uh, to come and visit them actually and see the lights for themselves and the dynamo in operation. Uh, though it didn't always work well. This is the point about reliability. Um, the fiasco of a dinner party, uh, actually here, is revealed. If the dynamo failed, uh, the lighting went out and everyone was back into darkness. So there was a need, clearly, to have oil lamps and uh, candles still. Uh, nevertheless, she did actually enjoy having electric lighting herself a great deal, even after her husband began promoting the electric light interests in the House of Lords. And then for reasons of political interest and honour, rare to be found these days in politicians perhaps, they then actually had to pay for this installation after all and at twice the going rate. Um, never mind, she enjoyed it. Um, she liked to call her bedside lamp the Randolph, because she said like her husband, she could uh, switch it on and off as she pleased. <laughs> so quite a, an interesting insight actually into feminine power, I think. Um, one other um, interesting strategy adopted was electric jewellery. Now, this might seem rather bizarre. Um, the point of this, actually, is that um, up till the um, 1880s, uh, there were gruesomely, uh, well, gruesome numbers of deaths in the theatre from women who caught fire from paraffin lamps and candles, actually, on stage. And the point about using electric lights in the hair was not only to glamorise them and, and provide a new kind of decoration, uh, but actually to show how safe electric lighting actually was. And these little um, jewels of electric light, little um, pea-sized bulbs, uh, were developed by Swan and, and Edison, particularly for the purpose of being worn on the body, with a little lead-acid battery underneath. I'm sure you'd all appreciate the, uh, the challenges and interest of wearing a lead-acid battery under your tutu, okay, as you've danced around the stage. Uh, but here is an example of it. And um, uh, in a book which I particularly do very much enjoy quoting. Um, it's Mrs. Gordon's Decorative Electricity. This is a copy I have here, if you wish to have a look at it later on. Do, do. Um, this was written uh, with her husband, James Gordon, who was an electrical engineer, and her assistance was, was crucial to persuade women to take up electric lighting. Um, she does talk about the episode of, um, uh, of her early life, you know, in the 1880s, um, adopting dress decorations of this sort. Um, and she said it was actually very, very amusing um, to see how one could actually decorate one's head with light bulbs and not actually catch fire. Uh, they had, I think, more of a sense of risk and far less health and safety regulation in those days, it would seem. But um, what she did find is that at one point, um, uh, the 
acid battery under her dress actually leaked. It was, it was actually ill-fitted. It was not correctly installed and overheated and leaked. And uh, she found herself destroying a dresser carpet and also the, um, the enamel bath into which she threw the battery after it actually leaked on her. And that was the end of her using um, you know, underdress batteries for these sorts of domestic electric lights on the body. Okay. But the point had been made that you know, um, e electric light was on the whole now linked with glamour and with a certain kind of level of safety greater than of gas lighting. Okay. So, um, but then we see, interestingly, um, those little pea-like electric light bulbs were unshaded. They were directly glaring of their own agency. And it's still the case by 1885, and this is the argument, well, this is the issue against which Mrs. Gordon's book is uh, directed, that um, lighting companies wanted to emphasise how bright and beautiful uh, these bulbs could be. The point being that given the enormous expense of electric lighting relative to gas, it seemed important to emphasise how much value uh, for money there was by having an unshaded, uh, an unshielded light, okay, getting as much as you could for your money. And the emphasis was very much um, on the, um, the um, incandescent light being soft and brilliant and not necessarily dazzling. So soft and brilliant, um, you know, soft perhaps like gas, but, but, but uh, brilliant unlike gas and not dazzling, that is unlike arc lighting. And the, uh, the assertion is therefore made in this sort of um, pamphleteering done by the Anglo-American Brush Company, okay, the one who supplied Lord um, Salisbury's Hatfield uh, installation, say so that you know, the, the incandescent light, they call it an incandescence lamp, interestingly, uh, was in itself a beautiful object. Okay, it required no decoration, okay, which uh, was at somewhat of a moot point. And, and interestingly, um, we find that this was not the view of some of those who installed them early on. Um, some of you may have heard of Lord Kelvin, Anyone um, know of him? Um, he was earlier in his life uh, Sir William Thompson, and this is his uh, second wife here, Lady Thompson. Um, they were, of course, very ex experienced in electrical um, experimentation. Many of uh, Thompson and Kelvin's instruments were used, particularly in the early um, telegraph cables across the Atlantic. So it is uh, interesting to see that he and Lady Thompson try out, at the earliest opportunity, Swan's Light and also Edison's in their homes. And they say, and this is a letter, that uh, Thompson writes to William Priest, the chief electrician of the post office, um, the high inc incandescence required for good economy, i.e. to make it worth running uh, a value for money, is too dazzling and would, I believe, be injurious to the eyes if unmitigated. So what he, um, particularly Lady Thompson, it this does seem to be Lady Thompson's idea, uh, start a, a, a plan of decorating all the electric lamps with silk shades. Okay. And this uh, makes it much more comfortable, it would seem. And they do this for the 112 lights they install around their, uh, their lounge. 112 lights, actually, quite extravagant. Uh, but uh, he made so much money from patents, he could afford it, shall we say. Okay. And had no children to absorb his wealth either. Okay. So this is one way to go. I mean, women are very much at the centre of this, this move to actually cover electric lights with silk shades. Okay. And this is the theme that Mrs Gordon picks up in her book, Decorative Electricity. Okay, you the word decorative is very important here, actually. That uh, um, lighting is not just a functional utility to keep you um, in operating after dark. It is also a matter of beauty and aesthetics. And uh, she reports verbatim several conversations she'd had. I mean, she'd been out there working as a collaborator with her husband, trying to persuade other women that they must install electric lighting in their houses, because these were the crucial people to, to persuade, not, not the menfolk on the whole. And she says um, in this book, in the first chapter, um, many of, sorry, most of the electric light found at present in dining rooms is very glaring and disagreeable, just like that, of course, of Lord, uh, Lord Salisbury's in Hatfield, and fully justifies the remark I so often hear made by ladies, I never will have the electric light in my house as it gives me a headache whenever I dine by it. And she reports the case of there being a, a, a dining table with ten lamps with lemon yellow shades uh, at eye level, and um, each uh, light shone into the face of each diner like a horrid little detective showing up every wrinkle and line in the face. Thank you. Okay. And she says later on that um, basically uh, no woman over the age of 30 should be seen, or should, uh, should allow themselves to be seen under an electric lamp, actually unshaded. <coughs> okay. So she's indicating that you know, women at, at her stage of life there must be some other solution than these garish lights. And she uh, doesn't show this, but it's, this is something I've picked up from um, a contemporary journal called Lightning. Um, there's a wonderful run of these, actually, the National Museum of Scotland Library, which reveals this rather interesting picture here. You can see this is just the kind of thing that Mrs. Gordon was talking about, these light beams glaring into people's eyes. I, mean, I wonder how many would really enjoy dining like that. And later in the evening, you can see rather interestingly, the, the male of the house um, is sitting alone under this lamp, and the woman is sitting 
in the corner, way out of that d uh, glaring beam, trying to escape from its horrible um, light interrogation. So very much, again, you see here, there's a gender imbalance in the, uh, in the appreciation of electric lights and its possibilities. So what Mrs. Gordon does is to advocate some rather interesting, um, exotic kinds of lighting decoration, drawn very much from uh, explorations, actually, of the Middle East, um, from um, Asia, from uh, Japan, particularly in India uh, and, and Morocco, using all sorts of uh, inverted lamps, um, uh, I guess religious objects too, and, and, and smart use of silk shading as well. I think my favourite one is this one here, which is of a desk lamp, where you have a stalk uh, leaning over the desk with a silk-covered shade. And of course, the, the uh, target of the stalk's attention is a frog. And the frog, of course, is sitting just up here underneath the stalk's uh, neck, uh, invisible to the stalk. So you see here, one can even be witty with electric lighting decoration as well, actually. Um, but that, that, that is one example of how she uh, suggests at no little expense, so you can make your very plain swan lamps look rather more attractive and less uncomfortable in the home. Um, another example here, you can see um, very uh, carefully shaded lamps for the dining room. Uh, no glaring bulbs directly pointing into your face, but actually shielding and soft enough so you can actually appreciate the artwork around the walls as well. Okay. And notice uh, particularly the use of classical uh, figurines here. Okay, you wouldn't do this so much, I think, with gas lamps. But actually, you can, uh, you can make uh, electric light appear, as with the figure of, of uh, truth and justice, electric light to appear a natural consequence of following the wisdom of the Greeks. I think a very important point for Victorian scholars. Um, now, this book goes down rather well, actually, it must be said. Um, in most quarters, um, in the second edition of uh, Decorative Electricity, there's a long list of good reviews, apart from two from the gas industry, which say it's an appalling book. Okay, you can imagine why that might be, of course. And again, do have a look yourselves if you like. But one of my favourites, actually, is from Charlotte Robinson, um, who was the home art decorator to Her Majesty uh, Queen Victoria, and is basically, I think, have I got it here? Um, that's right. She's uh, got a column regularly on decorative matters in the journal Queen, okay, the court newspaper. And um, she goes round and to uh, Mrs. Gordon's house and sees all of the, of the actual displays there and is most impressed by it. It's not surprising that Queen Victoria's household actually itself becomes lit electrically soon afterwards. And she says, you know, in ways that perhaps might be a little unfamiliar, uh, but uh, the um, artistic possibilities, uh, she says, of this illuminant seem almost limitless, actually. And no one can close Mrs. Gordon's fascinating book without being convinced of the beauty, economy, safety and decorative joys which await the happy owners of houses lighted by electricity. I think there were some very good tea parties, actually, which persuaded um, a Charlotte, actually, of that particular view. But there she is. Um, many other good reviews, which I could list, but I won't do, that, do so now. So just then to um, draw to one uh, f first conclusion before just saying a little more about uh, Lotherton Hall. Um, the key points to bear in mind here, actually, that the issue really was solving the disorderly, undomesticated nature of electric light. Um, what was it? Well, it was actually often portrayed increasingly by personified images of female, sometimes male forms, actually friendly fairies, wizards, goddesses, not imps, elves and gremlins, as was otherwise seen. Um, risks? Well, the risks were shown to be um, much less than feared by the wearing of electric jewellery. On reliability, well, large-scale systems installed in London from the late 1880s onwards actually show that it's possible to have something like the uh, regular supply that the gas has. Expense, well, the interesting strategy was that by uh, it, well, cultivating a sort of middle-class envy of the upper-class glamour, uh, one finds that increasingly middle-class households begin to adopt electric lighting. They are guests at the houses of the churchyards and others, and they wish to appear to be as glamorous as them and have electric lighting in as well. Um, garishness, that problem is solved, it seems, very much by women's very effective campaign for discrete uh, silk lampshades. So that's, that's in a nutshell, is what the book is about. So again, you don't need to go out and buy it now, if you can find a copy. But then just to say a little bit more about Lotherton Hall, because um, we're here, and it does seem to be uh, only appropriate. Um, oops. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Chiara for supplying me this, with this information. Um, what we know is that um, Lotherton Hall perhaps wasn't the very first take up electric uh, lighting, but certainly uh, when Frederick and Gwendolyn Gascoigne arrive, they do, they do take a, a serious approach to installing extensions and improvements from 1893, just after Mrs. Gordon's book is written. So it's um, 10 years later that they start to invest in electric lighting. I think by that stage, it looks like electric lighting is there to stay. Others 
like them were perhaps a little cautious on this particular point. But it's worth bearing in mind that the uh, colliery that they owned at Garfith had already um, had electric uh, lighting installed in it and some electric traction as well. And Henry Roderick, the colliery engineer, would appear to have been a major figure helping the Gascoigne's plan their installation at Rotherton Hall. And in 1903, you find that they put in a large array of incandescent lights from the London-based company Perry & Co. And these apparently are the ones, I think, in various forms still in use um, around the house. Um, and they had a Blackstone, Blackstone oil engine in the basement. And, of course, to back up, in case of a power breakdown, which, as I indicated from the case of Lady Churchill, was not by any means rare, they have 53 glass battery cells okay, out in the garden in the shed, so they can maintain power in all circumstances. And just to give you a little glimpse of this, um, this is the boudoir. It's not this room, is it actually? It's, the, it's down, down, down the way there. If you want to have a look uh, later on, you can see how effectively the lighting is made, um, you saw of actually, in these sorts of settings. Then, just to finish off, um, it's worth bearing in mind that not all country houses were very enthusiastic about the take-up of electric light. Um, certainly, the upper classes were, I mean, as it were, upstairs. Uh, those who were uh, convinced of the glamour of it, they were in, in charge of it, could actually make, make sure they understood the electric lighting operation and installation and make it safe and um, elegant to their specifications. But downstairs, many female servants were not at all persuaded, actually, of this point. Um, Dame Caroline Hazlitt, who was one of the many activists, actually, um, in the post-World War I period to promote electric lighting, particularly uh, to women. Um, she was in charge of the Electric uh, Association um, for Women. It reported that many houses in the country were not installing electric light because their servants re simply refused to use it. Don't forget, this is an era after World War I where many women who had actually enjoyed other kinds of work than servanting uh, refused to go back. Okay? They didn't like the idea of being in service. So they were in sh such short supply, they could genuinely say, no, we will uh, not be in service with you if you s install electric lighting. Um, and you can see, interestingly, that and Parlington Hall, also owned by the Gas Coins, thank you to Kara for that, actually, never had electric lighting installed. And Temple Newson, not far from here, but not owned by the Gas Coins, didn't have electric lighting until the 1930s. Indeed. And in some cases, electric lighting wasn't installed until the 1940s and 50s, after the first generation um, of people who'd experienced its unpleasantness in the 1980s, 1880s had actually died. And this, I think, is what led to my great, great aunt Emily Thomason's view of this. I mean, she had been a servant herself in one of these houses, I think, in the 1890s, 1900s. And, as I said before, avoided all these gadgets, hearing the, the rumours about his danger all along. And I think she wasn't entirely wrong. One might uh, smile at oneself, actually, thinking that how um, uninformed of you. But uh, I'll give you two examples of why one might reasonably have held this view for quite a long time, that, uh, that electric lighting was not always safe to be had, except for the utterly expert. Um, some of you may have heard of Hilaire Belloc. One of his cautionary tales is of Lord Finchley. Okay, this is 1911. Uh, Lord Finchley, he says, tried to mend the electric light himself. It struck him dead and served him right. It is the business of the wealthy man to give employment to the artisan. <laughs> okay. So if any of you wondered where that ever came from, that's, that's where it comes from. That's why the, the poem actually exists. Um, a little indication there, but maybe um, electricity was never perhaps fully domesticated, even for aristocrats who thought they might actually run the world still in 1911. And then finally, see for yourself... Gentlemen, don't let hard work kill your wife. Let electricity do it. This is from the 1930s, actually. So never quite fully tamed. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goodeco. Wonderful, interesting, uh, fascinating talk. Do we, we have some time for questions. Do, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yes. So for instance, the generator that was employed here, what typically would have been the voltage that was run through the property? Because obviously, we were talking about uh, Edison having the, the American influence, and uh, America has bottomed out at a 120 volts, whereas we're here in Europe, 220, 240. Mm -hmm. Do you have any feeling of what was typically used at that time? Well, I think. My sense is actually there wasn't anything typical. Each of the houses I've looked at had different um, installations, different generators, different dynamos, each of which were installed you know, on a bespoke basis. Um, so they could very widely. I mean, obviously, some of the ultimate current generators could be at very high voltage. I mean, in the, um, in the Hatfield house, actually, the, uh, the generation was typically that uh, in thousands of volts. So uh, a single phase? Or a single phase, that's right, yeah. basically, yeah. And what you see then in the DC systems is much, much lower voltage. I think much is made of the way that the voltages um, are, are, are what indicates safety. 
Mm. Much is made, of course, in Hatfield House with the accident there, that it was supposed to be the high voltage that was a problem. Not factoring um, that the wire was uninsulated and the man who actually slipped was uh, in wet grass. All these other things might matter too. But high voltage was clearly the, the bug there. So you see that low voltages, but I, I can remember looking at different houses and seeing anything between 50, 100, 200 volts actually. So it's not, not really until you have the national grid that these things become systematically <coughs> managed actually. And uh, I think particularly after the First World War, you get a sense that, I think when internet, well, I think the um, International Electrotechnical Commission um, gets going in 1900 and starts to set international standards for this sort of thing actually later on. But it's after my period, so I can say so things like sort of total separation and this sort of thing would be up to what they felt was suitable for their particular setup and then yeah. before it was standardized. Yes, but, but um, bear in mind that, you know, what became standard was a matter of trial and error and yeah. they only discovered what was safe by things going wrong and discovering the hard way what was dangerous. So, yeah. well, I think we still do that, don't we? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Not necessarily electricity, but in other areas. Like uh, yeah. Spacecraft, it's pretty experimental, pretty dangerous. Yeah, st stay on Earth at home, I think, possibly it's safer. Yeah. <laughs> Would we take the national grid for, for granted nowadays? I mean, we can't imagine a time when it doesn't exist. But if big government initiatives these days are anything to go by, I can imagine it was a real free for all when they were making the decisions back in the, I don't know, the 20s mm -hmm. as to how to build a grid. How long did that process take of we're going to have a grid one day? Um, so the question then is. How long did the national grid come uh, to, uh, into being? How, how long was the process? Yeah. Um, well, really, I think the first vision of a national grid is after the First World War. But it's not completed until after the Second World War, when, of course, the Labour government of the uh, post-war era sets up the, the welfare state and the national health system. And the national grid is all part of the package, making sure that the reconstruction of Britain post-war, and um, anyone who knows about the aftermath, of Britain needed a lot of rebuilding. And you couldn't do that effectively without a large amount of electrical power supply to, to light factories and houses. So it really is 1947-48 when actually the process is finished. So it takes a good 20 to 30 years. Um, I would say perhaps uh, that certain priorities were made. I mean, you can see that big cities are where much of the effort goes. And outlying villages, as I mentioned earlier, one in Wales, take a lot longer to reach. I mean, um, small-scale dynamos and solar power actually are, are still widely used in some areas like for mm. reasons you can imagine. So, um, it, it, I think it takes particularly a war or two to get everyone to realise perhaps how much you need to have a national system. Um, and was it two volts right from the beginning? No. It has several different goals. There were multiple different systems. I mean, it's been pointed out. Um, what one historian. Um, uh, Thomas Hughes has pointed out that there was a, a, an enormous diversity of systems in Britain, which he thinks is a sign of Britain's complete incompetence in managing these things. Um, my view is that if you look at London and you see each street having a different kind of uh, setup, different uh, voltage, different supply, different kinds of installation for light fittings, it's an attempt to limit the monopoly of supply. Because there was enormous fear of anything like a repeat of the monopoly of water and gas supply. These were very controversial in the 19th century, and the attempt was by the government to rein in um, power companies, to keep them all small and fragmented until it was clear how they, they can be managed together. So it was extremely diverse. And I mean, you can remember, surely, even until the 1970s, one could buy uh, f uh, um, gadgets with um, open wires because one had to install one's own plug, yeah. depending on which street you lived in. That it lives on that long, actually. And I can still see many ho uh, houses now, hotels in Birmingham even, actually, where you have the old round pin sockets yeah. left from that era. Okay. <laughs> as a testament to, I think, how much there was not agreement. And each company, like, I guess like, like Microsoft, and they wanted to be the dominant one and fought it out for decades until there was finally the international agreement actually on certain kinds of light fittings being standardised. But do you think that's a good... So what you know, I mean, surely that is what that generates the innovation that is necessary for things to move forward. You know, if you start off trying to implement the whole thing, through some sort of government body, it'll never get off the ground. Oh, certainly, yes. I mean, no, nobody in the government ever imagined um, that they would at first be in charge of electric um, lighting. It was such an uncertain business. I mean, um, it's clear, for example, that the early electric lighting systems of the early 1880s just didn't get anywhere at all. The, the government, if anything, wanted to suppress it. Uh, the, the, uh, I think it was the Liberal government of the early 1880s 
put in a very stringent uh, repurchasing clause for any license given to a local authority to set up electric lighting, 24 years. And no electric company thought they could make any money um, in that period, so they didn't bother. The companies collapsed. It was actually only Lord Salisbury's government in 1888 which actually decided uh, to change that. I think he had enough interest in electricity himself to see the way. So at that point, the compulsory purchase period was in 42 years. Um, then electric companies started to develop somewhat, but it was always thought to be something that had to be reined in rather than encouraged. And there was no sense of any obligation to actually light the rest of the country. Lord Salisbury famously made sure that his streets were lit, but never bothered giving much electric lighting to the houses of his workers. So no, there was no danger ever, of ever being a government initiative. And I think only, only after the First World War was there any sense that there was entitlement on no, the no, population habit, actually. It, yeah. been, you know, it wouldn't have happened had it been a government initiative in the first place. It needs the independence of organisation for these oh. things to flourish. Well, I, 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 I appreciate your uh, interest in counterfactual speculation, actually. I, 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 I am a timid historian who wishes to rely on what really happened, but I, but, I, but I do take your point that actually, yes, the nature of the innovation involved here was almost certainly that of independent entrepreneurs, yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, I'm interested in the process of how the electricity was spread at the beginning of the, the 20th century, mm. um, where you've got several different companies uh, buying against each other to supply electricity. Was it like the cable companies nowadays, where they were laying the cables and then inviting people to get their supply from them? Um, interesting question. I think actually it might have been um, a little different to that. What I, I'm aware of is that the glamorous installations of electric lighting as certain inst uh, installations, particularly that of uh, the Grosvenor Gallery, okay, the, uh, the art gallery, um, what transpired was the owners of that, I think it was Sir Coots Lindsay, um, found that many of those who lived in nearby streets wanted to be hooked up to his local supply. So those who saw the benefits of this actually knew that it could be run without much expense to the houses actually asked for it. Um, I think beyond that, actually, it was a somewhat messy enterprise. Um, gradually, it becomes clear that electric lighting um, is going to be potentially a moneymaker. So other companies step in independently of, say, the, the Grosvenor Gallery. But it is a matter, I think, ultimately, I, of the sort I think that you say, that there is competition. I've, I've not found any detailed pamphleteering about this, but you do see that um, there are adverts that appear in newspapers, actually, offering. Uh, to have your street installed in a certain way. Um, but yes, I would imagine that you would have had plenty of time to wonder about which system would be yours. Actually, it's clear that each street in succession being uh, given a different kind of installation and different kinds of so uh, sockets and pins uh, is evidence to some future archaeologists actually of how untidily competitive uh, the whole process was actually. Yeah. So things haven't changed that much. I think that's the force of your question, isn't it? Yeah. Do you have any more questions? Can I just demonstrate something further which illustrates perfectly what Graham's saying in this room? Um, just over here, this light fitting, um, talking about electric shades, is designed by W.A.S. Benson, who was an art designer of electrical equipment. These horrible Victorian commercial glass shades are not what's supposed to be on it. It's supposed to have elegant pleated glass shades. Um, designed by Benson himself in pale yellow silk. So that's an exact example of what you've been talking about. Interesting. Mm. And right. these elegant leaves are not supposed to be bolted together. They're supposed to flow out from the cables, um, sort of come down over here, sort of like that. Then you've got the, um, um, the uh, electrolyer, not a chandelier, it all required a new vocabulary in a characteristically incongruous French Empire style on a Georgian ceiling with the cups designed to, to take the bulbs. So that's, that's that. And then these Perry and Company shade, um, triple um, um, wall sconces, which were always designed to take electricity, never for, there was never gas here, with these, these kind of candle bulbs all going around the room. There's much more to see around the house, but that's a sort of brief. <coughs> Thank you, Adam. That's most interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why why didn't why didn't it have what it was designed to have on that that? Why didn't we have it was designed to that? Because it's on loan to us. We don't own it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so someone if later. Come to own it, the first thing I have to do is to take off those bit of shades. <laughs> it would cost a bit of money actually, because they would have to. You know, the uh, the the silk shades only survive in illustrations, so we wouldn't have to have them specially. Oh, okay. Up. 
and of course you'd have to be able to take very care. They may not have been terribly safe. I mean, they, you know, that sort of fabric can easily catch fires, but I'm sure you can find a way around that. Well, I think it's worth emphasising, to add to your point, that um, mm -hmm. the early suppliers of electric lampshades and so forth actually uh, didn't all survive. Mm -hmm. So it'd be perfectly um, possible to find yourself with insulation in your house and then the, the company that installed it were no longer in business ten years later. Mm -hmm. So that's why certain kinds of improvisation and tinkering are brought in. And eventually you have a much more um, utilitarian approach to decoration, which does not rely upon having one single decorative supplier to make sure your house actually systematically decorated with lights. Do you have any further questions? Okay, well, I think uh, we'll leave Professor Gooday to have a relax now. And if you'd like to join us all um, in the servants' gallery for tea and cakes and to have a look around, then please do. Um, and if you'd just like to join me in thanking mm. Professor Gooday once more. Thank you.